Hi everybody, my name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, I guess for everyone, there are things in their lives that in a way they wish were different. In a way they wish there was more health in a certain area. There was more money to be had for a certain thing. There was more companionship. There was more intimacy. There's more, 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 more. And yet, how many of us truly know that sense of peace, that sense of, of knowing, that sense of surrender into what people call God or love or truth? And really, I mean, we think that that more, that, that bit of extra, that, that something in addition will bring us that love, that knowing, that truth. And yet we've all had times when we have had, we have gotten lucky, say, and we have gotten that addition. We have gotten that extra. We have gotten that more. And yet still, that hunger to have the next more, the next addition, still exists within us. And something in us also knows that we can have an experience where there's nothing in addition, there's nothing more, that it's complete, that we're full, that we feel the connection, the oneness of this incredible life we have, and the connection between us all. And that all the mores and all the separations and all the additions that we think we can have don't add to a squat, don't mean anything. And what is bridging about again? What is bridging heaven and earth? What is the show about? Is to bring people literally from all over the world who have extraordinary gifts through, through the gifts of their life, through the hard work of their lives, through the dedication of their lives, who in one way or another have experienced that essence, that truth, that knowing. And they come to share their love and their gifts with us on the set and with you out in the audience. And again, we have tonight somebody whose life is dedicated to that. Dale Walker, he's a spiritual teacher. He's a healer. He's an author of the Crystal Book series. He's the founder and director of the, the Crystal Awareness Institute. 
He's the inventor of the Wheel, Wheel of Life medallion, uh, and also the inventor of the Mandala chargers. And he travels the world teaching healing techniques, teaching techniques that heal the physical body, heal, of, as we've talked about so much before, that they heal the heart, heal that hunger, heal that wanting to know by giving an experience of knowing, by giving us an experience of that unconditional love that's not dependent on a more, on an addition. And that's what we want. And throughout history, that's what the teachers and masters have done. They've traveled the world sharing that gift, sharing that experience with people so those people can then take that out. And, and just that momentum of love could, could expand throughout the world. And we also, as we normally do, we have these two beautiful music videos uh, from Alana Sweetwater. It's from her c- CD, uh, From Beyond... Uh, uh, beyond or Behind the Veil. I think it's From Behind the Veil. It's a beautiful, beautiful CD, and, and we picked out two songs from that. So again, you know, join me in a short meditation. Then we have Dale with us. We have some beautiful videos. And again, it's an opportunity to, in another way, experience that truth, that knowing, that God, that love. And that's what we're here to do and to share that with, with everyone and to go in our daily lives and just bring that out and out and out. And so join me in a short meditation, then we're going to have Dale, please. Hi, everybody. Okay, so we're going to start with our first video. It's Alana Sweetwater. It's from her, her CD, From Behind the Veil. And the first song we're going to see is Grandfather Fly Me Low. It's written and performed by Alana Sweetwater.
Hi there. Well, welcome back. So we're on the set with Dale. Welcome, Dale. Great. To Thank have you. you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So, how did you get involved? You know, in your life with crystals. How did that seem to be the, the you know, the, the connecting force for you? I had no interest in crystals before I woke up spiritually. I woke up on January 21st, 1975, and lay in bed thinking, "This is my 40th birthday." Uh, I've done what they asked me to do, a, a successful career as a contractor. I've, um, I have the house, the kids, the dog, the, the, the cat. The mortgage. The mortgage. I've, I've done everything they asked me to do and successfully, and I'm not happy. Well, it's they, funny. I mean, that I, I said that at the beginning. I didn't even know that story. That's great. Well, what I, what I found is that uh, I knew there was something that I needed to do, but I didn't know what it was. And I had had no awareness of crystals, no knowledge of metaphysical anything. Um, but then a lady told me, my neighbor told me about a psychic fairs in San Francisco. Bear in mind, this is 1975. They didn't have psychic fairs then. A psychic's just not like it is now. There's one on every corner. And uh, they told me about it, and I went to it, and I met a man who gave me a reading that was so incredibly accurate that I had a private session with him at his home, and there, along with a lot of other things, he had a, on a shelf, he had some crystals. And for the first time, I saw them, and I saw them as something other than just a rock. And I asked him about it, and he told me that uh, they were a source of power, and that um, I could get one from a rock shop, and I went there, and I got one, and things began to happen really quickly. I found when you talked about, you said that it's your 40th birthday and you had a spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. I mean, why don't you describe that? Because, I, you know, people who haven't had it or people... Well, the funny thing about it is every person who becomes a spiritual worker know, looks back and says, I know when it happened. I know when I woke up. Because I began to do things that were not physical. I began to look at life as something other than the senses told me. Something else was there, and I knew it, even if I didn't know what I was talking about. And the truth of it is, when I first started, I was so ignorant, I didn't even know what the language was. And they were talking about chakras and kundalini and um, So in other words, meditation. you woke up on this day, and something was different. Yes. Something was just yes. radically different. I was asked, I knew I had done everything that I should do, and I wasn't happy about it, because there was something I needed to do that I wasn't doing. Hmm. I didn't know what it was. I had right. no idea, but it, it happened so quickly. They, I found a, a teacher who, who led me into an experience that started me to doing channeling with a group of six people, and uh, that lasted for two and a half years. I didn't know about channeling. I knew nothing, but I began to do it. I began to. I opened up my inner teachers who began to teach me, and being a very pragmatic contractor, I found out that. Um, that I had to know the reason why, and I had to have something that worked practically for me. So if I wanted to do something, I would say, well, how do I do this, rather than just give me platitudes. You know, there's, right. book, there's hundreds of books about the universal laws and peace and harmony. And all. But where's a good book about how to do healing? Especially since I began doing it immediately with my crystal. Right. I so right away could, you could heal. Yeah. Yeah, and this blew me <coughs> away because I had no other healing ability that I had ever experienced before I had the crystal. And what, furthermore, I found out that if I laid the crystal directly on somebody's physical pain, it got very hot, and the pain disappeared. If I did this without the crystal, it didn't work. Wow. So immediately I began to experiment because I've always wanted to know what are the laws behind this. It isn't enough that you can do it. You should know why it works. Because if you know why it works, you can move beyond the experience into something new based on your understanding. And that's what I've done. How, how did it work? Tell us, you know, how once you realized this gift was yours. that Well, I really I immediately found out that um, I went to try to find people who understood about healing. So I went to the churches first. And that was a big mistake. Because the churches simply don't know how healing works. It doesn't mean they can't do it doesn't mean they don't understand they're supposed to do it. It just means they don't understand how to do it. They don't know the laws and the rules behind it. All healing comes from God, but how do you make it work? See? Like you, anybody can pray, but can you make a prayer that works? 
Well, if you know how to do it, you can do it. But they don't even teach you, most churches I've ever been to don't even teach you how to pray. I mean, they give you prayers, but they don't teach you the physics of it. And everything that works is of energy, and the law of energy is called physics. So there should be a methodology to everything. All you have to do is find out how it works. Does the energy go this way, go that way? Does it increase, does it decrease? If you can measure and determine what that is, you can find out what the, the, the principles are behind it. At least you can get up a really good theoretical structure, and that's what I have. Why don't you talk about that, the, th the structure, how crystals work, how they heal, why they heal, why certain crystals work with certain things? First of all, you should know what healing is and what it isn't. There's a start. <laughs> if you had a good host, they would ask that the question. <laughs> well, because most people don't really understand what the nature of it is. Um, when something blocks the flow of energy to the cells, the cells begin to die, degenerate. They can't reproduce themselves. And they send out a signal that says, hey, I've got a problem here. Send me some energy so I can repair it. And that's a lot of times a symptom. Well, that's right. And what happens is the signal comes up first as discomfort and rapidly increases to physical pain and in intense pain and to disability if you simply cannot give the energy to the cells. Now, no matter what healing you do, and I don't care if you're a medical doctor or you're a laying on of hands faith healer, all healing works through energy. If you're using pharmaceuticals, you're using uh, chemicals which convert to electromagnetic energy pulses which directly feed the cells because the cells work not on chemistry but they work on energy. So when you're dealing with that you must think of yourself in terms of what is it that I have to do? Well number one if there's something blocking the flow of energy and it can happen through a lot of circumstances it could be through chemical toxicity, it could be through some emotional trauma, it could be a physical trauma it could be a break or a cut. There are a lot of ways where you can have a blocking of the flow from, from the normal charging part of the cell into the cell itself. So what you have to do with healing is you must, first of all, get enough energy flow of the right kind, bioenergy, life force energy, chi, ki, prana, whatever you want to call it. You get that kind of energy going directly into the cells. First, it must go through the block that's keeping the cells from getting the energy. This is the biggest part of healing. It is not the charging of the cells. That's actually quite rapid. Five to 10 minutes you'll charge the cells up and, and start the major repair. But getting to the cells is the hard part. Especially if you have something like, say, a cancer. That's a lot of negative energy. Or AIDS or, or MS or any of the other major disability problems. There's a lot of negative energy blocking the flow through whatever reason or whatever method. And what you have to do is you have to create a, an energy charge strong enough to go through, dissolve or open a hole through that blockage so then you can go directly to the cells and start the charging process. If you can do that, then the pain reduces or disappears because the signal is no longer needed. So if you look at healing, it's really simple. You have to get energy back to the cells. Now how you do it? There's hundreds of ways to do it. And we all know of an awful lot of methods by which you can. What I found out is the crystal is an amplifier and an attuning device that actually automatically increases the bioenergy field of the body. Now, how did I know that? Well, I got myself a camera called a Curlian camera. So it's through a high voltage um, field of 50,000 volts or greater. You impulse it directly into the body. You touch your fingertips on the, on, the, uh, on the plate, the camera plate, the film plate, and you take a photograph of the pictures of, of the energy that's around the fingertips. And it has like a corona of little sparks. When you do this and you, and you do this with a person who's sick, that sparks are, have gaps in it and it's very low in light. If I take and do a healing directly on that same area within five minutes or less, maybe even one or two minutes, I can cause an increase in energy spark coming out of that area, which tells me that there is a charging effect that's taking place. And how would you do this? What would the physical aspects? Would you put your hands on it? Would you put crystals on it? Would you put crystals on both sides of it? How, how would that happen? You can do it just by your hands alone. And I use a little prayer called the light invocation. It says, I invoke the light of God within. 
I'm a clear and perfect channel. Light is my guide. Now, I, I always say this three times because I have measured the energy increase that takes place when you say this prayer. I don't know, I may be one of the few people who've measured the actual energy of a prayer. Not because I'm a religious person, even though I am an ordained minister. That has nothing to do with it. It's because this actually works. Physics of the energy of that prayer actually can affect the physics of the matter of some object, whether it be um, organic or even inorganic. I can actually charge it. I did a little thing um, at parties sometime, and somebody says, well, can you show me something? Well, you're at a party, you can't really do healing. I take a glass of wine, I put it between my hands, I say the prayer, and I hold it in place until the pulsing and the heat and the, and the tingling sensation stop. Then I have them taste the wine before and after, and every single time there'll be a change in the taste of the wine because the energy of that prayer generates an energy field in my hands, which then changes the molecular structure of the wine. Is it the prayer or is it your intent? Do you know? Or does it matter? Well, I'm, I'm quite convinced it's a prayer, and how do I know that? Because I did an experiment one time. I was doing a workshop in Hawaii. I took a group of people there because I figured this way I get paid to have a vacation, which I like. Right. And so I went to Hawaii, and one of the ladies who came was from Switzerland, and she was a lady who uh, was from the German sector, the three major sectors there. And so she said, Dale, would the light invocation be the same if I said it in German? I said, well, I don't know. I had my dowsing rod out, and I doused the energy field, having her say it in English, and then we started all over again and had her douse it, saying it in German. It came out exactly the same. And I saw one of my other students come by, and I had an idea, and I said, can you write down phonetically this in German? Somebody could read who doesn't even understand German. She said, yes, and she did this. I had that student read this who understood no German, she said it, and the energy field jumped out exactly the same, even though the logic section of the brain was not involved at all. Now we're dealing with universal law. We're not dealing with the human mind. But that wouldn't have changed system. someone's intent. I mean, someone's intent in any language. I didn't tell her what it was going to be or what we we're going to do. I simply said, read this. I want to Just read, read this. It. Just read it. So she had no intent. She had no idea that reading, that reading was not the prayer that she knew. I see. So she could not connect logically that this was the same thing in German. There wasn't, the words don't sound the same. Right. There are some similarities, but they, they're totally different. Okay, so, so you see this person who has some disharmony, mm -hmm. some symptom. Do you see where the problem is? If, if they didn't tell you, if somebody walked in and was unable to speak, would you in be able words, to... Do I clairvoyantly see an energy... There's a, a, a blockage here, there, or would not, you know where to go just intuitively? or Not very well clairvoyantly, but in fact, I can detect energy blockages in anybody, even, even over the, the telephone, or um, I did this on a television program one time where they called in and I scanned the person and was able to be accurate in, in noting areas of problems. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and part of what I do when I'm doing a therapy session with somebody is I do a thing we call the aura scan, where we scan the body, find detected uh, energy blockages, make corrections right there so that this becomes a, uh, an immediate correction in the energy field that surrounds the physical body, which we call the etheric body, and that etheric energy field directly feeds the physical body. So very quickly it will change the energy field of the body without actually touching the person. So, yes, I can do that, but, you know, that really gets into the psychic realm, and I don't bill myself as a psychic at all. Sure, I can do a lot of things, but that's not what I do. And so what I do is healing, and, and the, the psychic part comes when I do distant healing, because I can work on somebody anywhere in the world instantaneously, and within five to ten minutes, there will be an energy change. And furthermore, understand it's not just me. Any of my, my advanced students can do exactly the same thing. Okay, so somebody comes in and there's a disharmony and how you can determine or whether they tell you. Now, how do you relieve the disharmony, open the blockages? Do you do it always, you say this, the prayer three times and then do you hold a crystal? Do you not hold a crystal? How do you, how do I you do I have a do simple it? routine. Now, the first thing I do is I... Um, Give the guy ten bucks. <laughs> yeah, I give him ten bucks, and then he says, Gee, you, "You feel better." You I just feel, feel wonderful. Yeah, give me more money and see how much better I'll feel. Right. 
No, I just have a crystal I've been using now for oh, that's This is the one he just years. gave me. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. Um, I use a, a, a little pendant called the Wheel of Life. Right. This is a very interesting energy device because it, um, through the geometric form and a lot of other special techniques, I open up a doorway through which a, a very powerful energy field flows, and then into that particular matrix, I've, I've put several commands to the subconscious mind that it will cause uh, major changes in the body. Basically, all of them saying, heal, go into balance. I hold this in my hand, center of the palm, with the points out. The crystal is in my other hand, again in the center of the palm, but the point toward the fingertips. I place it directly on the physical, but let's say that you had a, a problem in the shoulder. I put the left hand directly on the pain area, the right hand on the opposite side of that part of the body, mm -hmm. in essence making a sandwich with the problem in between it. Right. I say the light invocation three times, which activates a movement, a pulsing of energy between my right and my left hand. And you can feel it. You oh, can absolutely. Feel it, yeah. Anybody who does this can feel it. All of my <clears> students <throat> get it immediately. Furthermore, within a, a brief period of time, that charging going back and forth into the cells causes a major change in the problem of the, of the person. We can reduce physical pain 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And, maybe and it will hold? Pardon? It, I mean, maybe. there's something that caused the disharmony to happen. There's something that caused the blockage. So would that, like, free it up or? Maybe. It depends on the intensity of the problem. Let's understand, everything is a function of energy. But if you spent 30 years developing your problem, it's unlikely that one 10-minute treatment is going to do it. It's been a long this time. This is not probably. a magic wand, people. It isn't right. poof and suddenly, oh, I'm healed. It doesn't work. Sometimes it does that, and that's scary because I don't quite understand the nature of that. It's not scary. I'm, that's surprising because I don't understand why some people will get a really quick total healing and some people will spend maybe... Um, 10, 12, 20 treatments to get it done. What we know is there is a mass of energy which is blocking the flow. That have been, could have been created over your whole life. Mainly it's emotional, but can also be physical trauma. But that energy has to be dissolved before you can even charge the cells. Now you can go through that energy, like make a hole through it, and then go into the cells and start the charging and reduce physical pain. That's what we do in... 10 to 15 minutes, right. maybe less. But the, to get to the core, let's think about the problem as having layers of experience. The closer that you are to the center, that's your, your oldest experience, and layers of experiences, are, which so add like to the peeling, problem. So it's like peeling the onion, kind of. And you have to get to the core of the onion and right. dissolve that before you're going to knock out the thought form that continues to keep the problem alive. I can take your pain away. But will it come back? It's a good chance it can. Let me give you a good example of this. I worked on a lady, a very good friend of mine, who had a benign tumor in her stomach that was about the size of a grapefruit. I mean, it was huge. And she didn't want to go to the, the hospital and get it done. She asked me to do a healing. So I worked on it for about, um, about a half an hour until I felt the energy stop. The body will only do so much healing and then it stops. Because it's like an overload in a short well, amount think, of time? Well, I think what it's doing is I think it has to have a time in which it, um, it does the energy change and gets rid of the waste. I think that's important. I see. So at any rate, I know it exists. But then you go and do that. Then that half hour period of time, this, the tumor reduced to at least half or less than half its size. You could visibly see it. So I said... Well, look, babe, uh, you know, it's, it's going to take a few more treatments, so come back tomorrow. Well, she got busy, and she called me finally three months later. It wasn't that important to her after that first time, I guess. It was out there again. Uh, Same so size. So she waited for it to get, she yeah. waited for grapefruit she, she, size. She really realized that, hey, I, I better so she do called something. me, she said, do you want to do it again? So I said, okay, but listen, you really need to have multiple treatments. It's un reasonable to think that one treatment is going to take care of all your big right. problems. So I did it again, and, and this time I really gave it a good shot and made it even smaller, about the size of an orange. Come In one tomorrow. hour session. Yeah, come back tomorrow. 
I didn't see her for another two months. Wow. And this time, here it was out again. And I told her, I says, I'm not going to work on you anymore. Go to the doctor and have them cut it out. It's a benign tumor. It's, it's not a difficult operation. They can go in, and one day you'll have it out. Uh, you'll be out of the hospital within one or two days, and you got it done. It's, it's complete. Because you won't let me do it my way. You won't do what I tell you to do because I know what needs to be done. Right. It so, can't be right. So go and get it cut out. So she did. She went and got it cut out, and that was the end of it. But that's a good example. You, my, my, my students know that I tell them this all the time. The greatest healing method you have is called repetition. Do it over and over again until all symptomatic problems are gone, and you have a period of at least 30 days in which you do not have a recurrence. Now, doesn't and that mean, you would know is you've gotten closer to the root of the problem. That's correct. You, you have a good chance that it won't come back again. If it does come back again, it says you still haven't gotten to the root of it. Because if I can get to the root of it and dissolve the thought form that keeps it coming back, it has no way of coming back. Right. It doesn't exist anymore no. in a sense. Right. All right. Well, maybe what we'll do is go to the video now, the second video. This one, again, is by Alana Sweetwater. It's from Behind the Veil CD. It's called Mountain Song. Okay? Alana Sweetwater. back on the set. So why don't you tell people a little bit about, now I know that you know, you're know you into healing the body, but I know, as I said at the opening, you know, healing the disharmony, healing the heart, connecting us to that mm -hmm. oneness, love, truth. I mean, so 
why don't you talk about that a little? I know that's so I important. I found out uh, several, a couple of years after I got going into the healing part, I realized I had a very good system for physical healing. I mean, it works. That's the bottom line. But I noticed that several of my clients I would work on, uh, the problem would come back again. And I noticed there was one thing in common with all those people, and they were people very heavy emotional, very heavily stressed. So it occurred to me that emotions were what was causing this to come back again. So I thought, well, how do we heal emotions? Now, bear in mind, I was a psych major, a psychology major in college, and I studied all the modalities and and uh, I listened to everything they had to say. And um, one of my instructors, even, and I noticed that there were maybe 50 different ways to do it. And some worked and some didn't work. And I asked my instructor, isn't there one particular method that will work for everybody? And he said, man is too complex for any one method to work on everybody. And a little voice inside me says, that's not true. But I had no way of knowing that. So when I looked at this, I went inside and asked my inner teachers. I, I have um, angels or energy masters who talk to me inside my head. Um, many years ago, if I had said this, they'd have put me in a little jacket, you know. They're and, actually coming now, but it, yeah, it's well, a nicer just, jacket. It's a tie dye now. Just tell them I, I like mine in a little gold, I may. Right. Um, and they let you keep the, uh, the medallion on. Hey, <laughs> what, I'm, I'm what happy. The hey? It's all an illusion anyway. Right, We're exactly. all in, uh, stuck right. in this planet Earth. Right. So, at any rate, um, I noticed, I asked my inner teachers about this, and they said, what is emotion? I said, well, they're, they're feelings. What is, what are feelings? I said, well, they're, I started to name different types of emotions, you know, love, hate, anger, all this. I said, no, but what are they at their basic point? Energy. And I said, well, they're energy, and they said, if they are energy, they must have polarity, which means there must be a positive and a negative charge. And we say that, don't we? Positive, energy, positive emotion, negative emotion. Right. Okay? And they said, there's a rule in physics that if you take one energy unit and put it together with another of the opposite polarity, they cancel each other out. So if you want to get rid of the negative emotion stored inside somebody, First of all, you have to go to where they're stored. And bear in mind, it's not a hard disk stuck inside your brain. That it's would stored. be easier. It would be easier. You could just open it up and place, pull right? it out and put a new right. one in. Yeah, it would be neat. We're but reformatting the It doesn't the host quite now. work that way. Right. If it's not solid, then what is it? And I realized that the, the major example of, uh, of our um, emotional storage is our memories. Now, where are memories? Well, they're in our mind. They're not in our brain, even though they're connected to the brain, because we can have uh, memories of times when we're in, in a coma, and unconscious. We can have an awareness. We can have an awareness we're in a, in, in, a, in a death experience where our physical body dies, and we can aware. Then you come back again, you're aware of it. And yeah, certainly when you sleep, you can have consciousness. Well, when you sleep, sleep your body dreaming. is not operating, your brain is not operating, but you certainly have a consciousness. So the mind is not the brain. But memory is in the mind. Now I'm looking at and saying, okay, well, if that's true, if I could locate where the memory is, I can isolate the emotion. If I can isolate the emotion and I can create a positive emotion and bring it into that negative memory, it should cancel the emotion out. Almost like one of those sound things. Exactly. Now, here's the thing. It's even more closely aligned with color or black and white. Because once you dissolve the emotion, you can still see the picture, but it's like I'm looking at an old memory in black and white. There is no charge, charge no energy. It's just, yeah, that I remember that. But Almost like it else. happened to somebody else in a way. And in fact, it rapidly fades away from your mind. You can barely remember it at all because there's no energy to keep it alive. So that would bring us more and more into a harmony. So if we can get rid of all the negativity in us, all that would be left is unconditional love? What if you had a method by which you could dissolve every negative experience you've ever had in your memories in all your life, and any one experience, no matter how traumatic it was, could be done in as little as... Um, 15 minutes, 
You could make a list of everything in your life, all your experiences. Which you wouldn't know them all, though. I mean, wouldn't some ah, be unconscious? I'll tell you something interesting. You can even dissolve experiences you're not even aware of. Huh. That gets fun. But you can do it. Now, also, you talk about, now, people, other guests on the show have talked about past lives. So, I mean, you know, these things could have built up over literally hundreds of thousands of yeah. years, these negative emotions. These, you were talking about well, the tie What earlier. we're talking about is emotions that are physically in this dimension, this particular experience, this lifetime. Even if it were generated by something in the past, and I'm quite sure that that's true. Mm -hmm. Even if they were, they're experienced now. If they're experiencing now, you dissolve them now. You don't, and yet, at the same time, I believe that I could take somebody back in a hypnotic regression, back to a past life, using the same method to dissolve it in that past life. Because in my mind, it's just a different kind of big hard disk memory. Here's a big, big super memory disk that experiences all the lives you've ever had. It's a big overview. Okay, then you have individual And so what would be the result that, that if you went into this big disk and, and cleaned out all the disharmonies, all the emotions, all, all the places where negativity exists, what would be left on that hard Pure drive? light. Pure light. And guess what? And in a you, human body that feels like unconditional you would love. Be, you, would be, you probably would not even need your physical body anymore because you would be in unification with God because God is light, God is pure love. If you became pure love, guess what? You become God or reunified So, with so in other words, when Jesus or other masters or even now people have said the Father and I are one, somehow their hard disk had gotten fairly clean that that was in some way a reality to them. Maybe through a lot of past lives they had cleaned it up because every time you come into a life, if we assume that reincarnation is true and you have all these past experiences where you did it wrong way, you have to make it up because the law of karma, interestingly enough, the law of karma simply is the law of balance and oh, harmony. Coming back into harmony. Well, if we have this spiritual balance, perfect balance would be perfect harmony, which would be love and unity with God. Okay? But in past lives, if we did it wrong, where we did something that was against that inner code that says don't do this, and we did it anyway, we have an imbalance. Okay, so we have to do something in the next life that helps to create that balance back again because... The law of the universe is everything has to go into balance. Now, but you, your healing techniques can do that also. I mean, can, bring, can bring that balance into wherever with At this At least arm. in this life, and I'm, uh, I'm convinced personally that if we can have a hypnotic regressionist person who's working with me, and they can take the person into a past life where they've had trauma, I'm convinced I could dissolve that. Because to me... Any emotion is simply a form of energy. And as a healer, I work with energy all the time. You can always change an energy from one type to another. If I have something that's really hot and I bring some cold in, I change the energy. And it's exactly the opposite polarity. Why can't you do the same thing with any emotional state? You want to... Um, okay, so how do you determine it? Let's say, okay, you come in, somebody comes into your office, your room, mm -hmm. and says... How would you do it? How would it work? I've got, a, I've got a problem. If you were to come to a therapist, you'd have a problem, wouldn't you? <laughs> I would say that you wouldn't Otherwise, be there. Otherwise, why are you going to go pay that right, money? Right, You probably wouldn't. No. Right. You have a problem. You know you've got a problem. Even if you're not sure what caused the problem, you know you have a problem. And the problem is usually connected to some automatic behavioral response. Wouldn't you say that most people would come in, I'm not happy? If they were going to my, you know, a therapist, yeah. something, I, I don't feel good, I don't feel right, I don't feel happy, I don't feel inspired, I don't feel energetic, so I don't a, feel empowered. So as a therapist, you start talking to them to find out what is it about your life you're unhappy. And you would do the same. Oh, sure. First of all, I have to define what your problem is or I can't work on it. Well, I take that back. I can work on it, it takes a lot longer. I can work on it even if I don't know what your problem is. I can work on it if you don't know what caused your problem. Right. I can still work on it. If it's an unknown source, if something happened in your childhood, for heaven's sakes, that, that's carried through all your life, I can still, through an indirect method, I can go directly to it and find it. Once I can find it and locate it and isolate it, then I can help the person to send energy directly into it, and it will dissolve and it's gone. And you'll also be teaching when you're 
doing this with a client, a patient, however you would look at it, you're also teaching them the technique so they make you obsolete and can start to deal with their own disharmony. You found out my secret. I really did. I'm <laughs> very yeah. tricky. Yeah. Um, I, I told this to a group of psychotherapists one time, and um, they got a little upset. They said, well, you're going to put us out of business. I said, no, I'm not. Right. What I'm going to do is of stuff I'm going to teach you how to, how to work on 10 people in a day and work on a permanent basis with them to dissolve their problems, which they won't come back for that problem again. And instead, you work on 100 patients instead of one or two. Now you really be doing healing instead of just repetitive nonsense. I worked on a lady in upstate New York. I was at an ashram, and I was there for the satsang with a with a guru. And uh, at the break, one of the the head of the ashram came to me and said, "Dale, uh, I've got a person I want you to work on." This lady, I took her off to one corner, and I, and she explained to me that she had this problem with her mother, uh, that she had never resolved, and her mother died. So how am I going to resolve it? My mom was dead. I am never going to resolve this thing. She had been in therapy for 11 years. It was actually worse than it was when it first started. It took me 15 minutes, and it was totally gone and never came back again. Wow. And not even in a therapeutic situation, but because I knew what her problem was, I showed her how to isolate it, get into the emotion, and make a change. It's really that fast. If you understand the nature of energy, then emotional healing is no different than physical healing. In fact, all physical healing has to dissolve negative emotions. Okay, so how, what, to what, make did it you, work. what did you say to her? I mean, you're not revealing anything. We don't, you know, no, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, basically, quiet privilege here. <laughs> her mother had always manipulated her and dominated her. I had her take her into a situation where her mother was shrunk down to just large enough to be in her hand. Her mother always shouted at her. These are certain keys you look for. And I had her imagine that she had her mother in her hand and she was shouting at her, but she couldn't hear her, so she held her up to the ear so her mother would have a chance to shout at her. That's so silly and it's so deep disempowering of the mother. Suddenly she realized that their mother had no power over her. I took her even further and I had her actually um, bring her mother a little bit larger so she was the size of a baby and put her with diapers, take unclothed and put diapers on her and feed her a bottle. And what that did is it took away the power of the parent. But it, what so it, was it like shining light on darkness, making, making something that was some, so heavy in a human being and lightening it, bringing light to it? When you dissolve the negative and why chaos, would that why would that dissolve the negative chaos? Would it just energetically? Because there was a positive thought form attached to what she did. She took control of her experience, which I teach all of my clients to take control of their own. They do more work at home than they do when they come to me. If they come back to me for, for multiple treatments, I take them from where they are and give them a whole new thing to work with. But in this case, her problem was she had no power. Her mother had all the power. And she was very angry at her mother because her mother had always dominated her, and she, she hated that. Right. Well, so, who, who would like it? Well, and, and, but the bottom right. line is she had no control over that now because her mother was dead. She could never make it right physically. But the problem was not with her mother. The problem was in her mind. Right. She dissolved Yeah, obviously. That. Right. But I'll give you an idea how you can dissolve, uh, another example how you can dissolve the emotion that's so traumatic <clears throat> that you would think it could never be done. One of my students um, was an elderly lady, and, and I was working with symbols and showing them how symbols actually have an energy field about them that you can actually you can feel by placing it on the back of the person and do muscle testing and show that it weakens or strengthens it. So I was asking for, give me two symbols, one which represents bad or evil and the other represents good. Well, the good was a heart. Well, that's everybody knows that. That's positive. Right. But she offered the swastika from Nazi Germany. Well, that's a good one. Certainly an awful lot of evil done with that as a symbol. And so we did some tests and we showed that that actually weakened the body. And I said, well, you know, there's an awful lot of negative energy attached to this because of all the work that Hitler did. And when I said the word Hitler, I could see her flinch. So I went to her and I said, uh, the word Hitler is really bad for you. She said, oh, he was the greatest monster there ever was. I can't even say the name. It just makes me so angry. I said, you know, that's not doing you any good. 
Yeah, it doesn't matter to him, and it's not doing I you said, any good. He's dead. He's bones. <laughs> Right. If he could, if he was aware, he'd be happy. He was making you unhappy. Right. That's, that's what, what he, he lived did. for. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I said, "Wouldn't you like to get rid of it?" She said, "Oh, it can never happen. It's just so terrible." In about seven, eight minutes, that guy had it timed. She was able to say the word Hitler, and she smiled. But the funny thing about wow. it was, that's fantastic. She got upset at me. Yeah, it was that was how she identified she said, it. He doesn't deserve me to smile about him, to, to feel good about him. I said, babe, he's dead. Yeah, right. What's it's only in your mind, and what? don't you want you to feel good? And I and said, you, you know to something? feel lighter. I've helped you to get rid of this, and that'll be rid forever. You will never be able to say the word Hitler or see the swastika and feel bad again. You'll always smile when you do it. You'll have a happy feeling. Because here's the key. If you're able to pump positive charge into the memory... When you dissolve the negative and you put in positive, guess what? That image it was bad for you now suddenly becomes good. And why not? Because it's just pure energy. And we live on reactive processes that are 95% of all of our actions are not. They're reactions. They're not conscious actions. We do everything automatically. Well, all of our emotions that run us are done on automatic, whether we like it or not. What I'm saying is you can dissolve the negative, you can change it to positive, and actually what happens is you can actually change your behavioral response from a negative to a positive. Then you're free. Is there a place where there's no negative and no positive, there just is? Sure. Once you've dissolved the negative, for instance, in the, a thought form, a memory, you're into that no space, that blank space. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can see the picture. I, I can see where Daddy was beating me when I was three years old. But I don't have any feeling about it. The no space is where you have no feeling either way. And you know there are many things that you, you can think about you don't have a particular feeling about. Now, is no space for a human being, is it more in harmony than a positive space? I because don't think it, so. Because... I mean, would you say that if somebody has a positive space because of the nature of that we live in a duality, there's going to be a negative space? But the neutral space is that space of, like, in between, like the, the razor's edge, where, where, like, love lives, where there's no duality, where the unconditional love lives? If you dissolve all the negative in your life and you replace it with positive, where's the duality? There's duality because we create that. It is one of the laws that all energy has a capability of being either positive or negative. If I have a match, for instance, I have an energy source. But if I burn a house down, that's negative. But if I cook a dinner, that's positive. Well, also, it's still maybe energy. that house needed burning down. I mean, because there's a lot I'm just of ways saying, for I'm just saying you have the capability as a human being with our powers of our mind to make choices of how we use energy. I choose to do everything in a positive way. It doesn't mean I have dissolved all the negative energy in my mind. I can still get angry, but it takes a long time for me to get angry. Instead, something can happen, and I react in a very powerful, positive way. A good example is my grandson was in a car and uh, parked in, a, in an incline, and he came out of the car. I had already gone into this house. He came out of the car. He bumped the thing, and... And um, he started, the car started rolling down, and he fell, and the car was rolling towards his leg and his body. I heard him scream, and I went through the screen door. I went through the screen door. I didn't open anything. And I came, and I held that, that, um, that car back. Now, I stopped a 4,000-pound car. I felt it later as my muscles were really sore, but I stopped it cold <laughs> and pulled the child out and then let the car drive back until we could stop it. Now, that's a positive reaction to something that could, by fear, from hearing it, fear could have paralyzed me. That's the negative. But without the fear there, what is my reaction? It was one of power and positive effort. Full, my full focus was on creating a change and, and resolving the problem, not on sitting there helplessly thinking how pitiful I am. That's For leaving him in the car. Well, not only that, but the fact that... That I he, couldn't do anything. The fact that, that if I hadn't done something, the car would have rolled over. If the very least it would have done, it would have broken his legs. If it rolled over the center of the body, it could have killed him. 
okay? I stop the car. I have no ability to do that consciously. I can't. I, I'm strong, but I'm not that strong. But under that circumstance, that's exactly well, what Well, we all did. have that power in us. That's what it But the proved. reaction was what counted. Instead of reacting in fear because I heard my child scream and being paralyzed, immediately I was in motion. It's in motion so much I had no awareness. I wrecked the screen door. I went right through it and then stopped the car. Good thing there wasn't a wooden door. <laughs> Everything would have Who knows what right would have through. happened. I would have probably bounced off right. it. I don't know. But my reaction was such. Okay, right. well, the point I'm making is what would happen to we as spiritual people if all the things that kept us back by being negative, all the behavioral processes that were created by our life growing up and, and experiencing life, what if that was all gone? How would you react to life? In a positive or a negative way? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's coming to the end of the show. It's amazing. So, you know, again, you know, how do we get to that positive? How do we know it? How do we have that experience? You know, and, and there were a lot of clues and tips and availabilities for us all tonight. Again, if you want any information about Dale, his workshops, his work, 805-687-2053. We love you. Good night. God bless you. Thanks for coming.